All right, so hi everybody. Um, thank you for being here. We're now officially starting our webinar. Uh, let me show you my camera. Uh, we're starting our webinar, The New Reality of Wildfire in North America. My name is Erika Sanchez and I'm the Digital Content Manager at Island Press. I'm very pleased to bring you this conversation about the role and the current state of wildfires. Uh, we encourage your questions during today's discussions. If you would like to ask one, please enter it on the questions box that's on the right side of your webinar panel. Um, uh, your, the, your, the moderator is going to be the one to ask it after the panelists' presentations. Um, after the webinar, you're going to receive a, a brief survey. Please help us out by filling it out. Uh, we'll also send you a link to the recording in a few days, and we encourage you to share um, all of that. Okay. Um, today's webinar is brought to you by Island Press. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher founded in 1984. Our mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and create solutions to its complex problems. We elevate voices of change, shine a spotlight on crucial issues, and focus attention on sustainable solutions. Today, we are offering you a special discount. Uh, you can use the code webinar on our website, islandpress.org, to save 20% on uh, two books that are by two of our panelists, Firestorm by Edward Struzik and Ecology and Recovery of Old Eastern Growth Forests by Andrew Barton. And now I would like to introduce you to our panelists. Um, Andrew Barton was raised in the Southern Appalachians. He is a forest ecology science writer and biology professor at the University of Maine at Farmington. His field work has taken him across the United States and to Costa Rica. His current research focuses on the response of forests to changing climate and wildfire in the American Southwest. He's the founder of several conservation organizations and received his bachelor's from Brown University, master's from the University of Florida, and PhD from the University of Michigan. Um, Dr. Helen Poulos is a plant ecologist who examines the influences of natural and anthropogenic disturbances on plant distribution patterns. Helen's work explores the mechanisms underscoring such patterns through the lenses of plant ecophysiology, biogeochemistry, and community ecology. She has worked in diverse ecosystems and has field, experience, field expertise in fire ecology, rapid assessments, restoration ecology, coastal marine carbon sequestration, and aquatic community dynamics. Edward Strusik has been writing about scientific and environmental issues for more than 30 years. A fellow at the Institute for Energy and Environmental Policy at Queen's University, his accolades include the prestigious Atkinson Fellowship in Public Policy and the Sir Sanford Fleming Medal for Outstanding Contributions to the Understanding of Science. As a Knight Science Journal Journalism Fellow, he spent a year at Harvard and MIT doing research with E.O. Wilson, Stephen J. Gould, and Richard Lewontin. His books include Future Arctic and Firestorm, and he's a regular contributor to Yale Environment 360. Finally, our moderator today will be Jennifer Marlon. She is a research scientist at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. She obtained her PhD and MS in Geography from the University of Oregon. Dr. Marlon studies perceptions of and responses to environmental change, particularly relating to climate and extreme weather events. She also conducts research in paleoecology and paleoclimate using sediment records and developed the Global Charcoal Database. Her research has been published on several journals and publications. I'm happy to hand it over now to Jennifer, who will be guiding our conversation today. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you so much. Uh, okay, let's make sure I'm on. I believe I'm on. Okay. Um, it is great to be here. And uh, this is an incredibly timely 
discussion instead of books. <laughs> um, and I want to thank you all for joining us. I, um, ha as Erica was just mentioning, I've been studying wildfires for about two decades now using charcoal that has blown and washed into lake sediments. And I've been reconstructing fire histories from uh, all over the world. And so even though what's happening right now uh, in the US and especially in the West uh, seems unlike anything else, it's actually part of a broader trend, a global trend, uh, because we've seen really severe fires in Australia in recent years, in Europe, especially in the Mediterranean. Um, we've even seen fires in Greenland, which we don't usually see. We'll hear a little bit more about that maybe. And um, Siberia, massive fires in Siberia that have generated smoke plumes that are, the plume is like the size of the whole subcontinent of Europe. Um, and of course, in the news most recently, the Amazon fires burning for two months, incredibly severe um, and just slowing down now because of the rains. But a lot of people, I think, wonder, are these seemingly distant events connected? And if so, how? And of course, the answer is yes, they are connected. They're connected by our air and our climate system, right? Because the whole planet is warming. Uh, the air temperatures are increasing, the land surface is warming, and even the oceans are warming. And a warming planet is going to have more fire in many places. And in fact, for me, this idea is uh, quite personal because this was one of the major conclusions of my own dissertation research that started um, uh, over a decade ago. And I knew back then that increasing global temperatures were uh, going to cause more fire, but I didn't imagine what it was going to look like and feel like. To see people trying to escape burning towns on TV or entire mountain communities um, being burned to the ground, I couldn't envision that. And I certainly couldn't imagine the cascading consequences of multiple extreme fires breaking record upon record in state after state. Um, and then last night I'm watching the news and, um, you know, I hear about PNG, PG and E, the utility company in California doing the precautionary blackouts, cutting power for um, over a million customers to prevent the power lines from igniting fires during high winds. Um, and I understand they have to, they have to do this, but um, it really feels like things are fundamentally changing, not just when an event happens now, but before events, after events, um, we hear that we hear the term new normal. And um, I think about, well, what, you know, what are, what's, what's, where are we going? What are some of the best things that might come out of this? And I think the best things that might come out of this are lessons, right? Lessons for the future. Um, and we need to understand how our actions are affecting these events. If we can at least learn from this, um, we can maybe uh, look towards solutions. Um, but people really don't understand the kinds of spillover and cascading effects that our changing climate is causing because there are no models that can really tell us what life is going to look like in a warmer climate. And while it's true that this is not all about climate change, of course, there are many factors uh, causing the changing wildfire regimes we're seeing, and we're going to hear from our presenters about that. Um, but one of the other aspects of my research is to try to understand our um, Americans as the public connecting the dots between global warming and wildfires. Um, and based on nationally representative survey data, we know that they are in some places, but they're not in others. So in California and Colorado, for example, um, large majorities of the public, 69 and 66 percent respectively, believe that climate change is increasing the severity of wildfires. In Texas, it's about 61% will say, yes, global warming is, is worsening wildfires. But you go to some place like Ohio or out in Eastern states um, and only 36% of the people there think wildfires are worse due to global warming. Um, so nationally on average, it's about half, 52% will say, yeah, these things are connected. Um, so this highlights a gap in public awareness and understanding of the relationship between um, fires and climate change, at least, that I think communicators and educators and the media and scientists can step in and help people understand these connections and how our behaviors now are going to um, affect uh, 
fires in the future. Um, and I think uh, there are many other factors that we're going to talk about through these presentations, and I hope you'll all um, enter your questions and we can, we can expand the conversation. But with that, I'd like to transition to our first um, presentation, which is um, actually is Andrew the first presentation. Is he going to go first? Either Andrew That's or Helen. Right. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, I assume everybody can see what is on my screen right now and hear me as well. Yes. Great, okay. <clears throat> well, Helen and I are gonna do a combined presentation to begin with, then Ed will take over. And we wanna thank Ivan Press so much for this opportunity for the four of us to talk to everybody about wildfires and thanks to everybody out there for tuning in as well. Um, I want to start by saying that wildfires are as much a part of nature as sunlight, water, and air. They occur naturally across much of the, of the earth. They're an important part of people's lives. They're increasingly front page news. Think California, Alberta, Amazonia. Um, let's start with a snapshot of wildfires right now. So this image that you can see in front of you is actually the location of wildfires burning in the United States today. Here's a map of fires burning across the globe. The bottom line is that we live on a fiery planet. And for tens of millions of years, fires shaped the ecology and evolution of the Earth. It continues to play a key ecological role in many ecosystems and the lives of many creatures, including humans. The problem, of course, is that human activities have now magnified wildfire to the point that it has become a serious problem. Media coverage of fires in North America has improved greatly. I've been doing fire stuff for several decades and compared, for example, to the coverage of the Yellowstone fires in 1988, there is a great improvement in media coverage. So you read stories like this that say, wildfires are raging, part of the trend of more, bigger, hotter fires, climate change and fire suppression are at least partly to blame. And this narrative is true enough. But even this kind of story leaves out crucial complexities. And so one of our goals today is to discuss these complexities and how they might help us understand and address the problem of wildfire in North America. Now, I want to start with some definitions just to make sure everybody's sort of in the, the same place to begin with. So by wildfire, we mean an unplanned, uncontrolled fire burning live and dead vegetative fuels. Wildfires that are greater than 100,000 acres are termed a megafire, and you might be surprised by how many of these megafires occur every year. The prescribed fire is a planned control fire set to accomplish very specific goals. Fuel is anything that burns. So for wildfires, we're talking about live and dead vegetative matter. A few more definitions. Wildfires are usually divided into three types. Surface fires burn vegetation that's on the ground, dead and live vegetation on the ground. Crown fires burn into the canopy and what are called ground fires actually burn, burn underground. They burn peat, fossil fuels, and other fuels as well. We'll really focus on surface fires and crown fires today. Our goal really is to start from first principles uh, to, and then sort of build to a conceptual framework about how wildfires work in nature, and then to use that framework to better understand the problems that we face and some possible solutions. So let's start by identifying the requirements for any kind of fire, burning any type of fuel. Well, you need heat or electricity, which is needed to supply some sort of spark. You need fuel to burn, and then you need oxygen for the combustion process. Now, if we apply this to wildfires, um, heat is provided by lightning or by humans, either planned or accidentally. Fuel, what we're talking about are live fuels and dead fuels. We can divide those up into finer ones. We can divide them up uh, into trees, shrubs, grasses, coarse ones, fine ones, et cetera. Um, and then of course, oxygen is needed. So the question is, if a spark occurs, 
What does it take for that fire to catch and to actually spread? Well, first of all, the climate and the weather have to be such that conditions are dry enough for the fire to actually catch. Um, given that, there has to be continuous fuel for the fire to burn and to spread. So if, if we put those two things together, what we're talking about are places where there is enough dry continuous fuel. So the question then is globally, if we want a little bit of context, where do fires occur? Well, there are some places that are too dry to support much fuel, and there are some places that are too wet to actually carry a fire. So fire is uncommon in deserts, and it's supposed to be uncommon in rainforests, except, of course, as we know now, with serious human disturbance, as we've seen in Amazonia, and as we also see in deserts sometimes as well. But there are many places that are actually just right, not too dry and not too wet, as you can see here. So I don't want to go into detail into this figure, but here are places where wildfires occur commonly, naturally, and we want to say unnaturally as well. Um, let me just make one note here. There are places that um, burn naturally and regularly that are actually fairly moist, but they tend to have a very prominent dry season. The Pacific Northwest of North America is a really good example and very relevant to the webinar today. So that's a place where there's a lot of precipitation, but there's also a strong and long dry season. And there's some years where that dry season is extremely dry. Given that many places have enough dry continuous fuel at some time during the year to support wildfire, what determines what those fires are actually like? In other words, what controls whether wildfires in a region burn as crown fires or surface fires, occur frequently or infrequently, burn as infernos or mildly, and stay small or spread to become big fires? I'm going to turn this over now to Helen to explore this a little bit more. Great, Drew. Thank you so much for that introduction. Can everyone hear me? Um, so uh, what determines fire behavior? Unlike the fire triangle that's influenced by heat, oxygen, and fuel, the fire behavior triangle explains how fire acts after a fire is already ignited. The fire behavior triangle is similar to the fire triangle in that it's comprised of three parts, but the parts in this case include weather, topography, and fuels. And unlike the fire triangle, the ways in which the three parts of the fire behavior triangle interact is much more complex. So first, let's talk about the, the fuels at the bottom of this figure. A fuel's composition, including its moisture content, uh, chemical makeup, density, these are the things that de determine the degree of flammability of fuels. The amount of fuels is another driver of fire behavior. Fuel moisture and fuel amount are the most important variables in this part of the fire triangle, where the drier the fuels, the hotter the fire, and the more fuels there are, the hotter the fire as well. So now let's move on to weather. Weather conditions include wind, temperature, and humidity, which also contribute to fire behavior. They can vary daily, seasonally and annually. So you can have one windy day during a fire that makes a fire burn over a vast area. Or you can have a dry year that may promote lots of fires regionally. Finally, let's talk about topography. Topography describes the shape of the land and slope steepness. Both of these very are spatially dynamic, but temporally static influences on fire behavior. And what I mean by that is across a mountain range, you can have large scale variation in topographic conditions over short geographical distances, but that doesn't really change much from year to year or from fire to fire. Drew, can you forward the slide, please? And so here's one example of how topography can influence fire behavior. Slope steepness can determine how quickly a fire will move up or down hills. So for example, if a fire ignites at the bottom of a steep slope, it will spread much more quickly upslope because it can preheat the upslope fuels with rising hot air. And upward drafts are also more likely to create spot fires or fires that spread aerially to another location. Alternatively, fires that start on ridgetops generally creep downhill slowly and burn at lower intensity or at lower temperatures. Next slide, please. So none of this slide just demonstrates how different parts of the fire triangle interact by the relationship between fuel moisture and fire size. 
and it also demonstrates recent changes in this relationship over time. What you see here is that fuel moisture drives fire size over all fires since 1984 in the western United States. But what you also see is that fuels are drier and fires are bigger in the years since 2000. Next slide, please. So one of the ways that we can conceptualize how fires work in, in a particular site or in a particular region is through the lens of the fire regime. A fire regime characterizes welfare characteristics that prevail in an area over long periods of time, meaning decades to centuries to millennia. And so we can classify fire regimes using a combination of, fire, of, of characteristics, including the type, which would be a surface or a crown fire, for example, the frequency or how often any one location on the landscape experiences a fire, the magnitude, which would be intensity or as in how hot the fire is or severity as in how much damage it does to the vegetation. And then of course, fire size, how big are these fires? There are other characteristics like fire seasonality and fire pattern as well. Next slide, please. And so there are two basic types of fire that fall at the end, two ends of a continuum. At the one end are frequent low severity surface fires, meaning that they kill few trees. These fires typically occur in places like ponderosa pine, longleaf pine, prairie or grassland, where there are a lot of, of highly aerated fuels uh, across the surface of the ground. And forests with, fire regime, with these fire regimes usually display discontinuity in the vertical fuel bed, i.e. surface fuels and crown fuels are vertically separated from each other under surface fire regimes. On the other end of the continuum are infrequent high severity crown fires. They're driven by fuel accumulation over time since fire. And the vegetation types that experience high severity wildfire generally have a continuous horizontal and vertical fuel bed. So when I talk about horizontal, I mean across space. And when I talk about vertical, I mean as you look up into the canopy. Next slide, please. So these two images show what these two different types of fire regimes would look like on the ground. So the top image is a crown fire regime where high severity fires are common over long time periods. The bottom image depicts a frequent surface fire regime where fires typically burn at low severity in this system. Next slide. So what causes these two different types of fire regimes? Well, they're driven by differences in the fire behavior triangle. <laughs> surface fires occur on drier sites where fire weather promotes surface fires at frequent intervals. Those frequent intervals maintain low fuel loads in the forest because they consume fuels at regular intervals. And therefore, low severity wildfires are common under frequent surface fire regimes. Alternatively, infrequent stand replacing fires are common on moister sites with more biomass, more productivity, and higher fuel loadings. In general, those fuels are too wet to burn, but fire weather in a particular year may dry fuels enough to combust, and when those fuels do combust, they burn a severe stand replacing wildfires due to the heavy fuel loadings that have accumulated on these moister sites during fire free intervals. Next slide, please. So the continuity and distribution of fuels is a major driver of fire regime. Fires that make it into the forest canopy burn hotter and have a higher probability of fire. And this is important because recent changes in fire regime are driven to some degree by the fuel matrix. Drew is gonna talk about that some more, but recall that fire behavior triangle that I showed you at the beginning of, of my talk. The figure depicts in this that you see here depicts how the vertical distribution of fuels and ladder fuels drive fire severity. Ladder fuels are fuels that uh, are fuels that connect the surface and crown fuels, and they're particularly important here because they provide this conduit for moving fire from the forest floor to the canopy. And once you have a crown fire, you have a high intensity wildfire. Next slide. And, and lastly, from my, my perspective here, before I turn it over to Drew, I also wanna mention that wildfires are patchy. And so this image shows the nature of landscape fires. Many fires are also mixed severity in nature. And this means that a single wildfire can burn as a hot crown fire in some places, as a cooler surface fire in others, and it can leave some areas unburned when we think of this from the landscape scale. 
So plants and trees have also adapted. Uh, sorry, thank you, Drew. <laughs> um, plants and trees and fire adapted forests with a long evolutionary history of wildfire have developed a range of adaptations for survival and reproduction in fire dominated landscapes. So thick bark and self pruning or the loss of lower branches by trees are common adaptations to surface fire regimes. Thick bark insulates trees from low intensity surface fire. Self pruning or the loss of lower branches by trees reduces the amount of ladder fuels that could move a wildfire from the forest, forest floor to the canopy, thereby reducing the probability of fire. Next slide, please. So in landscapes where crown fire is prevalent, on the other hand, trees have developed other adaptations. These include cones that require heat to release seeds or serotony, which is shown on the left. Trees with serotonous cones often has br have branches at the top of the tree. In other words, they have lots of ladder fuels. This kills the tree because it promotes crown fire, but these hot fires also open up the cones and promote post-fire seedling establishment. And then another adaptation to crown fire is re-sprouting from roots that survive fire, as shown on the right. This image shows that the tree was top killed by the fire. You can see that in the dead stems at the top of the picture. And it shows re-sprouts that have regenerated after the fire from root systems that survived the fire event. So with that, I'll turn it over to Drew to talk about increased wildfire activity. We think that understanding uh, this conceptual framework of fire regimes and adaptation to specific fire regimes um, is really essential to understanding how fire activity is changing and what possible solutions there might be to deal with some of the problems associated with those changes. So <clears throat> what I'd like to start by doing is to first examine in a little bit more detail how wildfire activity is changing. And here's a good example. So this shows the number of large wildfires on U.S. Forest Service land in the western U.S. And it shows that there's been a considerable increase in the number of these large wildfires over the last several decades. Other studies show increases in the total number of fires, the total acreage in, um, in the United States and in Canada, acreage of high severity fires and more. It is important to point out, however, that these results do vary a lot from one place to another, one region uh, from one region to another, from one ecosystem type from another, so that there are more increases in fire activity in some places than in other places. And some of that can be explained by the conceptual kind of model that, that we've presented here. That is, what would the natural fire regime be in those places? So let's explore that in a little bit more detail by asking the question of, well, what causes, what is causing this increase in fire activity? Climate change and fire suppression, probably as most of you know, are two of the largest contributors. There are others as well, such as insect outbreaks, but we'll focus on cl climate change and fire suppression. If we go back to our simple model of the factors controlling fire behavior, we can see that climate change and suppression alter fundamental causes of fire behavior. They interact, but for now, let's try to separate them at least to some extent, to look at the independent impact of at least climate change to begin with, and then we'll look at fire suppression. So what climate change does is, of course, it, it uh, has an impact on that uh, leg of this triangle to the left part. And we have strong evidence that climate change is causing hotter, drier, windier conditions, and even in some places, more lightning strikes, and that this is increasing wildfire. Let's look in a little more detail and provide a little bit of evidence about that. Um, this graph will help us look specifically at the contribution of climate change to increase fire activity. Look at the dotted line on the left graph, which shows the area burned in the western United States over the past several decades. Um, so you can see that it has increased. So you already know about that. The colored part of the graph shows what that increase in burned acreage would look like without climate change. And the graph on the right shows with climate change. So this graph, the two graphs together show two things, more wildfires, um, more wildfire activity that is, and that climate change is responsible for about one half of that, at least in the Western part of the United States. Now, let's turn our attention now to fire suppression. Fire suppression explains a large portion of the rest of the increase in wildfire activity, although there are, again, other factors, such as I said before, insect outbreaks. But let's just focus on fire suppression here. So fire suppression can increase the amount of dead fuel that would normally burn and allow more trees to establish and to grow. 
it can also greatly increase the continuity of fuels. So as Helen described earlier, so that fires uh, can spread more easily, both horizontally across the landscape and vertically from the surface into the crowns. Now, it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than that, however. In frequent surface fire regimes, which is the focus of this slide, that scenario is certainly playing out and there's abundant evidence of that. So for millennia, frequent surface fires kept fuels at relatively low levels. Then active fire suppression combined with grazing largely halted that natural thinning of fuels. And so combined with climate change, this is leading to a transition to more severe, often frequent crown fires. But it's a little bit more complicated in places that are naturally characterized by infrequent crown fire regimes. Some of these places burned only once in 100 years. So a century of fire suppression did not have the same and has not had the same impact as in frequent surface fire regimes. In these ecosystems, the impact of putting out fires is really variable. It depends on the actual background frequency of fires and some other things as well. Um, let's turn our attention now, given that we know kind of how fire activity has changed, we have a conceptual framework to some possible solutions to these wildfire problems. And I'll turn it back over to Helen for that. Thanks, Drew. So what should we do about these recent changes in fire behavior? Here I offer a few ways in which we might combat the issue. So as Jennifer talked about at the beginning of this talk, um, mitigating climate change seems like an obvious one, right? But that is a very tall order that all of us are trying to figure out how to address. Keeping global warming to two degrees Celsius as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's fifth assessment report begs for is a step in the right direction. However, doing that will really create, a, will really take a globally coordinated effort. And it's really complicated to figure out how to mitigate climate change to reduce wildfires globally. Um, there are some other tools, however, that managers have at their fingertips. And those include things like prescribed fire and forest thinning that are being, and these are being applied widely today to lower wildfire risk about, uh, across both federal and private lands alike. Thinning and prescribed fire around habitations to lower fire risk is another possibility. Defensible space in the wildland urban interface is a major fire management concern. And then of course, there's the let it burn policy, which can be effective in remote areas where human lives and livelihoods are not threatened by wildfire. Um, and so managers really have few tools to deal with the increasing prevalence of wildfire. However, these represent some of the potential options for mitigating the risk of wildfire. Um, across these areas that are experiencing heightened wildfire activity. Next slide, please. And so this slide is really one example of a way to mitigate fire risk that's being applied widely today. Note how thinning changes both the vertical and horizontal continuity of fuels. That's the main idea behind both prescribed fire and forest thinning, to change the amount and distribution of fuels to lower fire risk. This is common in fire suppressed areas, However, it's less effective for locations that are adapted to crown fire, mostly because fires tend to burn hot there based on forest structure. Remember, there's little self-pruning that occurs in crown fire dominated systems. So thinning doesn't do much to change the forest structure in crown fire systems and reduce fire risk. Also remember that thinning is a surrogate for fire. In other words, it doesn't scarify the soil or remove many of the fine fuels that are responsible for fire spread. Next slide, please. And you know, there are a lot of constraints. It's really operationally difficult to do this work. Um, people don't always like prescribed fires in their backyards. They don't like smoke. Um, and thinning is really uh, labor intensive and requires a lot of machinery. And it also costs a lot of money. Next slide. And so the projections are really for a warmer and drier climate with more fuel in some places, not all and larger, hotter, and more frequent fires. Next slide. And so here is a simulation or an animation to show you the change in fire severity over the past several decades in Canada and into the future. And these climate models show an increase of in prevalence of Arctic wildfires as human warming conti continues to advance in the Arctic this century. 
fire severity will likely increase, therefore, with these increased temperatures. Next slide. And so what are the projections in terms of fire activity? Well, they can be varied. Ignition-wise, more lightning is going to lead to more fires, and more people on the planet as the human population increases will also lead to more ignitions and more fire. Fuel loads will increase due to higher carbon dioxide levels, higher temperatures, and more rainfall. But it could also decrease in some areas, well, decrease, excuse me, in some areas and vegetation types as a result of higher temperatures and less rain. Fuel conditions, higher temperatures and decreasing rainfall will increase fire activity, while more rain in some areas will decrease fire activity. Talking about weather, higher temperatures will greatly increase fire activity. So obviously from this slide and from our talk, you can see that this is a complex scenario with fa these factors having varying effects around the world where climate change affects local areas differently and because different vegetation types have spe specific responses to changes in weather. So with that, thank you for your time and we'll go ahead and turn it over to Ed. Thanks, that was great. Um... I'm going to come at this from a public policy point of view and describe as best as I can in 12 minutes uh, what 120 years of public policy, how it got us here and where we're going to go in the future. And I'm going to start this presentation off with what uh, Helen and Drew uh, started off with, uh, with the fire triangle. And uh, this will come up later. This will make sense later on in my presentation. Um, okay. Wildfire before us Europeans arrived on the scene. Um, you know, according to, uh, let me just, if I can, just, sorry about this, we seem to have frozen. Okay, um, sorry about that. I'm afraid my screen has frozen. Okay. Okay. Before Europeans arrived on the scene, sorry about this, charcoal layers and sediments and methane concentration in ice cores show that the amount of global burning fluctuated dra dramatically over time. And those charcoal records derived from lake sediments and peats at hundreds of uh, places around the world show a distinct lull in burning from about 1600 to 1750. And that lull in fire occurred during the Little Ice Age when temperatures in North America, Britain, and Scandinavia dropped by about one to two degrees Celsius. But fires still burned on the landscape during the Little Ice Age. Uh, lightning strikes accounted for an unknown but significant number of fires before the arrival of Europeans. And presumably many of these fires loomed large because resources were not there to suppress them. Humans were also part of the fiery equation. We know this because indigenous people routinely lit fires to clear the land in order to attract game and to nurture the growth of berries and root vegetables. Uh, we didn't like it, and I'm talking about Europeans here. Uh, we thought this was just a horrible thing that they were doing. It is most lamentable to see so often such masses of valuable timber destroyed, almost invariably by wanton carelessness and mischief. Unfortunately, the Indians have a most disastrous habit of setting the prairie on fire for the most trivial and worse than usual reasons. John Sullivan of the Palliser Expedition was not alone in saying that. Uh, people like Thoreau also thought lighting fires was a bad idea, and he accidentally lit one at Walden Pond in Massachusetts, was his famous retreat. And, uh, but then he had a change of heart when he saw the forest ge regenerating fairly quickly, and he concluded that I have set fire to the forest, but I have done no wrong therein, and now it is as if the lightning had done it. These flames are but consuming their natural food. Thoreau was ahead of his time. Most of the early settlers came from Great Britain where there were few, if any, wildfires of significance. And they arrived at a time when that little ice age brought cool, wet weather to the east coast of North America. But then a new reality unfolds as the little ice age starts petering out. Higher temperatures and more lightning that came with it set the stage for big fires and forested landscapes that were rapidly filling up with people. And people we know uh, start fires. 
A big fire such as Miramichi, which burned in Maine and New Brunswick in 1825, was inevitable. And it was a big fire, 10 times bigger than the biggest fire uh, that's burned in California thus far. No one knew how to deal with a fire as big as Miramichi. People were helpless, and we know this from some of the descriptions back from that time. Here's one. Those fortunate enough to be near a river took refuge in the water, often trying to coax their cows and pigs with them. The livestock were panicked by the smoke and the flames and refused to enter. Most of them succumbed to the heat and smoke. Wild animals had no such fear of water. The humans in the river found themselves surrounded by wildlife, including raccoons, deer, bears, and even large moose. And then big fires followed with increasing frequency. When the Peshtigo Fire of 1871 killed between 1,500 and 2,400 people, over a million acres burned. The Hinkley Fire in northern Minnesota in 1894, 418 people dead. The Porcupine Wildfire in northern Ontario, 200 dead, half a million acres burned. And then the one that really changed the course of fire history in North America, the Great Fire of 1910. There's about approximately an estimate of 1,736 small fires were smoldering in northern Idaho and western Montana that very hot, dry summer. And then in August, hurricane force winds blew in. Three million acres burned in just three days. 86 people died and a lot more would have died had not the military and the railroad companies come in to save them. By this time, people started thinking that maybe we have to have a different relationship with fire. One of them was California timber harvester George Hoxie. He wasn't alone, but he said it best when he had, he said, we had best adopt fire as our servant, otherwise it will be our master. And Hoxie suggested that we do what the indigenous people did, light small fires to reduce the amount of fuel that could burn in the forest. The state engineer of California was in favor of it. A lot of timber owners were in favor of it. The Southern Pacific Railroad was in favor of it. He may have prevailed had a fourth element not been added to the fire triangle following the big burn of 1910, and that's why I put it here, politics. The big burn of 1910 ignited a culture of wildfire suppression. Politically, something had to be done to adapt to this new reality. Henry Graves, who was a U.S. Forest Service chief from 1910 to 1920, said that fire, forest fire protection is the first measure necessary for the successful practice of forestry and that the doctrine of light burning is nothing less than the advocacy of forest destruction. And those who preach the doctrine have a large share of responsibility for fires which their influences cause. His successor, William Greeley, vowed that a fire like the one in 1910 would never happen again. Wildfire was a menace. Prescribed burning, he said, was evil. Fire prevention is the number one job of American foresters. In the decades that followed, a number of strategies were implemented to reduce the amount of fire on the landscape. The first thing we did, well, we kicked out Indigenous people out of our national parks, such as Yellowstone and Yosemite, as well as Banff and Jasper. And in some places, if they were caught lighting fire outside of the parks, they were fined. A more organized, institutionalized forest fire strategy was put into place. Ferdinand Silcox, who was Forest Service Chief from 1933 to 1939, came up with a quick action strategy, was adopted by Canada as well. All fires were to be controlled by 10 a.m. of the day following discovery. Fire lookouts were built to detect fires. Heliographs were used by rangers to send fire messages by means of a mirror in the sun's rays. Tree phones were used to communicate the location of a fire. A wildfire control center dispatched firefighters by foot, by horse, by truck, by boat, by rail car, on hand levered pump trolleys, by train. And then in 1933, the U.S. established the Civilian Conservation Corps as a make work program during the depression. It was nicknamed Roosevelt's Tree Army. Between 1933 and 1942, 6.5 million days were spent fighting forest fires. The Royal Canadian Air Force, after the First World War and after the Second World War, were deployed, deployed to find fires. The U.S. Force established uh, their own air patrol unit. We had smoke jumpers were deployed to, fly, to fight fires in the U.S. 
and civilians on both sides of the border were encouraged to participate. Advertising was used to demonize fires. This was very common at the time. And Smokey the Bear, as we all know, became the North American symbol of, of the effort to promote forest fire preven prevention. And finally, science added sophistication to fire suppression strategies. The results? Between 1920 and 1950, by one estimate, 10 to 50 million acres burned annually in the U.S. By the 1950s, annual burn area was as low as 1.9 million acres. The century-long demonization of fire continued right up until 1988, when the U.S. National Park Service allowed lightning triggers fires to burn in Yellowstone. The timing was unfortunate because it ended up being the hottest, driest summer on record. The 240 fires that burned that summer put fear in the hearts of decision makers and a public that had all but forgotten or had never heard of the Great Fire of 1910. President Reagan dismissed the relatively new let burn policy in Yellowstone as cockamamie. Uh, his sec interior secretary, secretary described it as observed, and he ordered national park officials to fight all fires from that point on. The Yellowstone fires made it on the front page of every major newspaper in the United States. Everyone thought a national icon was destroyed, never to return to its original state. But time proved them to be wrong. Grizzly bears and black bears immediately moved back into the burn areas to feed on carrion. Fire beetles moved in to lay their eggs on warm stumps. Nighthawks and woodpeckers fed on the beetles. Owls nested in snags feeding their chicks rodents that were more exposed in fire-scarred areas. Aspen shoots shot up even as the fire smoldered. Elk and bison moved in to feed on aspen shoots. And the coniferous trees followed. Grizzly bears fattened up on roots and berries that thrived in burned out areas where the sun was able to shine through to the ground. 30 years later, it is hard to detect evidence of that fire. But it gets more complicated. And as, uh, as Helen and Drew had pointed out earlier about climate change, that's the new reality that comes into play. And we saw it from their graph, and we can see it from this graph. It's getting hotter, and as hotter it gets, we're getting more lightning in some places, extended droughts, disease, and the pests that come with them. And the higher temperatures, more lightning, drought, disease, pest, as well as higher winds in some places, and an increasing number of people in forested landscapes began testing the limits of firefighting resources. And since then, destructive fires have been burning more often and in increasingly unpredictable ways. Look at the Canberra wildfire of 2003. It produced an F2 tornado and black hail, at energy equivalent to a 22 kilotons of TNT, more than Hiroshima, atomic bomb. On May 4, 2016, the Horse River Fire near Fort McMurray in Alberta burned so hot, it created its own thunderstorm on a blue sky day. Lightning from that pyro CB ignited a cluster of fires more than 20 miles from the fire front. No one ever had ever seen anything like it. In 2015, a slow-moving thunderstorm in Alaska shot out 62,000 lightning strikes in five days, triggering 286 fires. Again, no one, ever see, no one had ever seen anything like it. And then in August 2017, heads were really spinning when uh, five pyro CB events occurred in just five hours, almost simultaneously in Washington State and in British Columbia. And since then, we've seen pyro CBs in places like Texas, Portugal, South Africa, Argentina, and Western Russia, where they've never been seen before. It's becoming an immense challenge for forest firefighters, for national parks and protected area officials, for water quality. Have a look at this. This is uh, uh, Cameron Falls and Waterton National Park on the Alberta-Montana border. Water flows out of Montana, crystal clear over to this fall. It's a great tourist attraction. That's one year before the Kenow fire that burned in Waterton, I think in 2018. Look at what happened a year after a thunderstorm. What happened to the falls then? It flowed black for nearly a day. Do we have time to deal with this? Well, Drew and Helen had showed you their graph. Here's another one from Dan Falk. It all shows that we're 
projecting a fairly major increase in fire in the future. Now, how's this going to play out? Well, from a public policy point of view, we've got to consider changes in forest structure. Water quality may be degraded. Fish populations could suffer. Old growth forest animals may be impacted. There are going to be highway closures. Visits to national parks could be curtailed. Timber harvesting may be restricted. Communities and government assets will be threatened. And as we see this week in California, there may be blackouts. Air quality is also going to worsen, threatening public health. Business as usual is not an option. It's prohibitively costly right now to continue with the status quo. California just set up a wildfire fund of $21 billion to deal with damaged claims. Business as usual is not going to be successful. So I'm saying in this presentation and appealing to decision makers is that we've got choices to make. We can have the good fire, the manageable fire, or we're going to have a lot of ugly fires down the road. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Ed and Drew and Helen. That was really interesting. <laughs> um, we have a few minutes for questions, so I encourage people to enter questions into the chat box and we can pick them out. And maybe um, if the presenters would like to turn on their webcams, people can see us. And um, I would like to just kick off uh, a question I have because I'm in thinking about the history, Ed, that you just showed. It reminds me that even though it doesn't always seem like it, people's attitudes do change, <laughs> even very deeply held fundamental attitudes towards fire. And it seems to me that with these extreme events going on and you know what's happening in California, and even from polling data, we know that people's attitudes are changing. And I'm wondering if, if any of you actually, um, in talking to uh, people on the ground, working with fire um, or dealing with its impacts, do you feel like there is a willing to change the way we think about fire? Is there sort of a drive and a motivation? What, what, what are you hearing when you talk to people doing the research that you're doing? Well, from my perspective, uh, what I find more interesting is that the attitudes that uh, have really changed and the leaders in moving forward are those indigenous people that we told not to light fires. And you see it in Western uh, United States and Western Canada is on reserve lands. They're thinning their forests uh, much more rapidly and doing a lot of prescribed burning much more rapidly than we're doing outside of the national parks because they understand the nature of fire, the good nature of fire, whereas I think that a lot of people still are having trouble with trouble with it. Uh, national parks, for example, let's say in Banff and Jasper in Canada, are still reluctant to do prescribed burning at any time of the year. They try to do it in the shoulder seasons where it doesn't affect tourism. Um, I think that's a bad strategy uh, because it really does handcuff those fire managers in those areas. Thank you. Um, I have a question here um, from someone listening about how do we approach these ideas in uh, forests that are really being managed to produce timber? How do you deal with that, uh, that seeming conflict? To anybody who has thoughts about this. And, and actually, there's also a, a broader question as to um, any advice, in fact, on how to manage forests to support adaptation to these changing fire regimes, you know, whether that's thinking about your species mix or other things you can do. Oh, I can't, yeah, you're muted, I think. So I, I would say that um, a lot of these forests are being on federal and um, private lands that are being used for, uh, that are being managed for timber. For example, lots and lots of forest service lands in the United States are being managed using the kinds of tools that I talked about, including prescribed fire and thinning. Um, and and actually there is, um, and, and so so it's, and, and there are also, these kinds of activities are also being done uh, to a large scale on private lands as well. And um, I have,
quite a few colleagues in the Pacific Northwest, for example, who are working with uh, landowners to actually implement different types of adaptation strategies in the face of climate change in terms of thinking about how to manage forests in a hotter, warmer, a warmer, drier, more fiery environment. And so that's very much on the forefront of the way that managers and private landowners are thinking about the future trajectory of forest management, um, especially in the Western United States. The challenge, of, sorry, I was just going to say the challenge, of course, is that is to try to um, so to mimic natural disturbance regimes as a restoration tool. So don't just go in and thin the whole forest. Um, but thin the forest to create an array of clustered and unclustered groups of trees that, that, that mimics the sort of natural distribution patterns of how a forest would look. And so, and that's happening both in areas that are unmanaged and areas that are also harvested for timber. I think that what, uh, what they're also finding is, is that uh, in trying to plant trees to uh, compensate for what might be lost in the forest fire. Uh, climate change is having an impact there as well because there, we're now beginning to see some major failures in the replanting because it's just too hot and dry for some of these seedlings to come up. And it's a question, it's a challenge I think that uh, we're going to face increasingly down the road is how do you deal with it? And what kind of forest are you going to have uh, say 20, 30 or 40 years from now? So the lack of regeneration of seedlings, is that due to warmer temperatures and drier conditions, or is that because the fires are burning hotter? There's some question about are fires actually burning hotter, or is it that the climate that the seedlings are coming back into is changing, or is it both or either? Well, if you look at the, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but there's a picture there of a scientist in uh, Wood Buffalo National Park, uh, which burns so hot and so burns so deeply in the duff that uh, the pine forest that was there is not likely going to regenerate for maybe 100, even 200 years because there's just no nutrients in the soil. I mean, this isn't widespread, unfortunately, but I think we're beginning to see it happen more and more often. And that's something to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so I think Drew also, this is, Drew, you're muted, but um, I think he has, it was trying to say something to that effect. Oh, okay. Oh, you're still muted, Drew. Maybe mute and unmute. Sorry about that. There we go. Well, Ellen and I work a lot in the American Southwest. And um, in there, I would say that it's hard to generalize why there's not regeneration of certain species, although we have some ideas about what's going on. So in some cases, the fires are so big that there aren't seed sources close enough for regeneration. In other cases, it seems to be that species such as conifers, pines especially, are not very well adapted. They're adapted to frequent uh, surface fire regimes. They're not very well adapted to these crown fires. So they're killed. Um, they're trying to come back from seed and a combination probably of those characteristics not being very well adapted to crown fires and drier conditions. There's a long-term drought in the Southwest are all combining to make it difficult for some of those species to regenerate. So. I would say it's hard to generalize, but we have a lot of the pieces of the puzzle um, right now. It's a very active area of research trying to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a question about the last graph that Drew and Helen showed with the arrows going, some going up, some going down, you know, how rainfall and vegetation affects the future of fires. And one of the things that I don't think I saw on that graph was population because of course population is increasing and people, we love to set fires, <laughs> uh, whether accidentally or intentionally. Um, and so is that yet another factor that is leading, are more human caused emissions occurring and making fires more common? Absolutely, so human ignitions are, I mean, there are quite a few recent papers that are documenting this on the large scale. So it's not just that the climate's getting warmer, that, but people are a major, and they always have been, people have always been a major ignition source of wildfires across the globe as long as people have been on the planet. 
Um, and so, as you well know, Jen, right? <laughs> and, um, and so the increasing population is only going to make fire beget fire. So. And, I and think in the terms other, of, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the, other, the other problem is, is that in terms of public policy, we've allowed these people to move into these forest environments uh, without changing, say, building codes. People are still building houses with cedar shake shingles and sidings. Uh, they're landscaping their gardens as they would, say, in Washington, D.C. or New York City. Well, not New York City, but, you know, with the ornamental juniors, highly combustible plants. And so we're lagging in the areas. We're not making these communities that are moving into the forest more resilient to, to fires. So I think that's the other problem that we have at play. So how do we do this? I think this is exactly right. And there's another question relating to this. How do we have these difficult conversations about the economics of you know, improving our building codes and, um, you know, doing things that are tough initially, but are essential in the long term. Um, if we don't, I mean, I mean the costs are, are skyrocketing, as, as we were mentioning. It's just, it's not sustainable to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, what are the, what are, how do you approach this? How do, how do we think about this? I know well, nobody I, has the perfect answer, but <laughs> if I could just use one example is that San Diego has power right now because they're burying most of their utility lines. Mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco with PG&E didn't. Yeah. They talked about it, uh, but they determined that it was too costly. And I think they might be questioning whether or not uh, that was a good decision because you can't have a half a million people or plus uh, without power for an extended period of time. So that's one small thing. There's a heck of a lot of others. So I don't know how we are on time. I'm seeing it's 4.31 if we have a hard deadline or if we go for another minute. We could go maybe one more minute. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. So I think um, one of the things, I, I, I'm wondering if there was one thing that you could explain to the public um, and maybe that includes natural resource managers, something that you could tell them about fire that they may don't know or probably don't know. What, what would it be? What would you encourage people to talk about if they're going to talk about this issue? I might say uh, that we're probably going to have to tolerate some discomfort. So maybe more smoke than we want. We're going to have to get used to fire, uh, hopefully good fires, in order to kind of carry out some of the solution. And we're going to have to get used to some experimentation. That's a really scary mm -hmm. word to use in this context, but I think we're going to have to have a little bit of tolerance for, for those, those things. I think we need some creative thinking. Yeah. Yes. I, I'd, I'd uh, add to that is that we've got to change our perception about fire as well and regard it as a meteorological event like a uh, hurricane and tornado that cannot be controlled uh, once it gets beyond say uh, 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 10,000 acres in size. Uh, and I, I, I recall uh, the fire chief from the uh, city of Los Angeles uh, came to a talk that I gave uh, UCLA and he someone asked them you know what do you need to be able to control a fire the next fire that comes along because you know we're willing to pay higher taxes for that and he said ma'am the only thing that's going to stop a Santa Ana driven fire is the Pacific Ocean right well I would also I would also add to that that we also need to the way we think about fire in the context of, of how fire works in relationship to our living space so defensible space, for example, is really important in terms of thinking about building design as one, but thinking about when you have uh, your home next to a forest that could potentially burn, you need to think about making that home uh, have a barrier between, it, it ha have discontinuity in the fuel bed, right? So the fire stops before it gets to your house, right? And, and there are lots of other kinds of sort of adaptation strategies where we can be a more resilient population thinking about living in a fiery future to try to minimize the damages. So for example, in paradise, having one road in and out of your town is maybe not the best way if you're thinking about fire risk and 
loss of human livelihood. So we need to think smarter in terms of thinking about fire being a part of our future and think about how we're going to live in that environment. Yeah, very good thoughts. Thank you all. I think we are out of time here. Really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.